to Business at the Speed of Coffee, the one show about business, by business, for business. Well, have you ever wondered why and how brands appear in front of you? What makes you want to go and buy a particular packet of potato chips or bottle of milk? Well, behind all of that is usually a great deal of thought and a great deal of creativity. Well, one such person who's had his life immersed in this kind of activity is the one and only Peter Cullinan. <laughs> now, Peter, Come. welcome to Business at the Speed of Coffee. Now, I didn't want to tell your story for you. I want you to tell your own story. Uh, we do now know, and I should tell our listeners, that late in life there was Lewis Road Creamery and Antipode as water, but it wasn't always like that. When little Peter came into the world, where was he? <laughs> what was his household right. like? Uh, well, good morning, Kim. So, um, first of all, uh, my father was um, a pilot in World War II. He was a, a bomber pilot. He had a good war, as we say, and came back uh, to New Zealand uh, from the war and flew for what became Air New Zealand. One uh, of the pioneers then. Yeah, he was. He was. He was still in uniform uh when, when they started flying for union airways which was a yeah. domestic airline that became you know nac and then became in new zealand for us at the time was uh Para -para -Umu. wellington wellington yeah uh and so then we moved to to uh wellington when the rongatai airport opened up and i can oh, yeah. still remember <laughs> um that airport opening, you know, it seems like a long time ago. Now. Big household, well, lots of brothers and sisters. Uh, two, two brothers, two brothers, and I. You know, we we still see our. You know, we get on famously. Close. We were very lucky growing up. I think we had a. You know, our father was a fabulous, fabulous guy. Like a lot of that generation who've been through the war, was 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 quite quiet and you know never talked about the war and everything else. But we were we we grew up in in in, in a street called Perth Street, and there were about five neighbours, all by chance, were all had fascinating war histories. You know, they'd be, they'd, one had been at D-Day and one had been here and one had been there and so on. So we, we, we always had a fascinating sort of, um, we, we were surrounded by really interesting um, fans. But it was a comfortably off household? Yeah, well, they were, you know, airline pilots. So and then where did you go to school? I went to convent school in Kandala and then we went to St. Pat Silverstream. So we, we boarded, all three of us boarded out at Silverstream, yeah. which is only like 20 minutes away by train. So it was sort of an odd thing to be at a boarding but school. But education has been a big part of your life because you've got other qualifications as well, I gather. You might remember this, Kim, but way back in the day, you, you had School C and then you had UE. Yeah. A friend and I were done having a smoke-o during the, during the accreditation, uh, you know, name calling, because we thought we had that in the bag. Mm. We, we, so, so, we're, so we're out of bounds having a smoke. So we came back uh, only to hear that we hadn't been accredited. So You had to go to the exam. Yeah, so we had to, uh, so that's the first time I've worked really hard. You know, that was okay. like three or four weeks of reasonably intensive SWAT. Um, so, so you know, so I got Yui and, and 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 so on. But a family friend was the general manager of a of a local agency called Dorma Beck, which oh, you know, yeah, well, that was an old name, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so he was kind enough to to uh, to take me on. And the, but that that was as an apprentice, basically. yeah, basically as an office, you know, like literally, at, you know, literally starting You're starting cutting stuff, cutting envelopes, get, getting to know yes, sort did, of yeah. how, how how the whole thing works. Something just happens, and and a, and a and a and a switch goes on, and you and you become engaged. And you thought this was interesting work. I found it fascinating, and I just and it was it was suddenly. So what sort of are the early accounts that you were working on there? Uh, the first. The first account that I worked on of significance yeah. was Griffin's Biscuits oh, and, well, and, and Toffee Pops and all that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, and, and the, but, the, but, the, but the way I got that job was um, uh, Griffin's at that time had Dorma Beck doing most mm -hmm. of the work and then a brand new agency called Ogilvy and Mather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and Ogilvy and Mather was like the first of the real internationals to come in and, and so I had them and I had them in my sights. Thought this would be brilliant. So, so I was at a, I was at a, uh, some meeting out at out at Griffin's, and the, 
Ogilvy, a car director, was there, and his name was uh, Jim Thang. And Jim Thang was a young, you know, American, you know, like smart ass. And he drove a TR6, which, you know, in those <laughs> yeah. days was like, you know, Very that sexy. was the bee's knees. And he gave me a drive back. Uh, Griffin's at that time were out in mm. Tony or Lower Hut. And he drove me back to one and said, yeah, how, how would you feel about... Um, Maybe meeting some of some of the people at at, uh, at Ogilvy and your age twenty three or oh, something. Oh, should I say age at age you know nineteen yeah. or something or other? It was <laughs> amazing. It was amazing. That uh, that led to you know interviews with with the uh, with the CEO, a guy called Rennie Cunnock, mm. and Rennie was um, a Cambridge grad. He was you know just a just a cut above anyone else yeah. I'd I'd sort of worked with at the stage. Um, and, you know, very bright, very disciplined, very driven. Um, and he offered me a, you know, a role at Oakley. Was that like, was really the, the beginning of, of In those days, Wellington had a lot of head offices oh, yeah. and businesses. Ford was there and all these other people. Oh, yeah. I Frigidaire. think there was more big business in Wellington, actually, than there was in, in, in Auckland. Yeah, there so was indeed. All yeah. the banks were there, yeah. all, the, you know, all the financial institutions, etc. There, there, were, there were two great agencies at that time. One was Ogilvy & Mather, which was yeah. the epitome of an international button-down you know, global agency. Uh, and the other was Colenso, which was this you know, wild breakaway creative agency that, again, you know, did famous work yeah. um, almost from day one and, and sort of changed the change there can't be were the seeds of an actually. entrepreneurial spirit sown there yeah there were and I and I remember um, really early thinking you know I'd, I'd love to do something else as well rather than just sort of advising people and this is like the you know the the the, the, the arc of my, of my career, I think, that I'd love to do something myself. You well, know, I mean, the trick in advertising important. was to, uh, the only ones that survived uh, were the ones that could marry up uh, a, a commercial idea with a creative one. Yeah. Because the, the two often aren't, uh, you know, they tend to be mutually exclusive. Um, was there any particular discipline that you felt that made a difference in you being successful when others mightn't have been? I always thought that advertising, the, the, the way to think about advertising is as a weapon. It's, you know, you, 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 you're pointing it to have an effect and, and if you're not achieving something with it, you're not working it hard enough. Advertising worked. The, the media was the growing in a new way. Oh, the television. Yeah. And it was the, incredibly powerful. Yeah, yeah. New Zealand has been them. something of a gold mine for good advertising yeah. people. Because I've gone around the world, worked in other places, yep. and used to Kiwis Pier, at yeah. all the amazing yeah. places, uh, and, and done very, very well. So we must have some breeding ground for these sorts of folk here. It's a small industry, mm -hmm. and it's it's relatively easy to get a start and and to shine. You would have been there at the transition from when it was a commission-based business yeah. to when it became a fee yeah. earning, which was quite traumatic, yeah. I think, for the industry, yeah. was it not? Yeah, really traumatic. But, 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 it, but, but it took sort of decades to get to where it is now. Okay. I think what was more traumatic for the business, as I see it now, actually, is the is the drop in the effectiveness of the product itself? You know, it's just—it's still effective. It still mm -hmm. works, but it's—but it's—but it's not the given that it that it because of what influence of social media and things oh, like yeah, that. People yeah. just aren't, aren't aren't using media in the same way, um, and and with the growth of social media, which sort of you know I'll get onto when I talk about mm -hmm. Lewis Rowe, but but that that allows people to make an informed decision. They don't need advertising to tell mm -hmm. them you know that brand A is better than brand B because they can go on a website and. And, and look at look at testimonials and you know yeah, they, yeah. they are va people are vastly better informed now than we were 20 or 30 years ago. Well you've got to turn ago. the data into useful information which is another topic. Yeah. What where was the genesis of the, the water company? The genesis of the water company, which was Antipodes, was when my wife and our little one, Grace, and I moved to New York, Simon Woolley, who was a friend of ours in, in, in New Zealand, when Simon decided to come back to New Zealand, which was shortly after I think we had decided to come back, we had a meeting, uh, in inverted commas, in, at our holiday house in Tapo. Towards the end of the day, Simon said to her, I always wondered why we served um, you know, Italian or French water. Why, mm. what, what's wrong with New Zealand water? That was the very beginning of Antipodes. But they're That's already the New Zealand stuff. waters. Yeah, but they weren't. There were there were no premium New Zealand waters. They were all, you know, the, and it actually goes to sort of one of my um, core beliefs, Kim. You know, we, New Zealand tends to do stuff on the cheap. Mm. You know, it's just our, our default option is to do it, you know, either as a commodity or or 
or, or, or what's the lowest possible cost? Well, the we perception can do is that you need to have a price point that people are going to buy it in volume. Yeah, but I, but but that's one part of the market. But there's another part of the market who who aren't interested in price; mm. they're interested in quality, and. And that market is, I reckon, much bigger than most people. There's more profit in it, I'm sure. Well, th there's more profit in it, but it's, it's just more interesting. So rather than a sort of drive to the bottom, like what, what would be uh, New Zealand water that could compete with the world's best waters yeah. and win? What would that look like? And that's where we started. No, you know, he was a restaurant too. I was, you know, we, we were all ad guys. Yeah. We, we had no idea how this, how this stuff works. But we went to a... Um, there, there are one or two companies that import vast numbers of, of bottles from around the world. And we went, we went and, and, and selected, you know, probably 50 different bottle shapes and had them on our, on our apartment table. Kim Thorpe came into the room and a guy called Len Cheeseman, who's a fabulous typographer mm -hmm. uh, and designer, and they, their hands went immediately for what's now the iconic Antipodes bottle. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, like a white medicine bottle. Yeah, basically. but very hard to hold yeah, and actually, yeah. you know, like quite a clumsy bottle. Yeah. So we thought, okay, well, let's let's run with that. Then we went to um, Soul Bar for lunch, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> as you do. As you do. And the waitress uh, at the time said, you know, I don't know what this bottle is, but but I can't hold it. This will never work. But we persevered with that bottle shape, and that was a sort of an incredibly distinctive part of the You brand. didn't have any water at the stage? I didn't have any water. And I can remember, um, I can remember driving around the Bay Plenty looking at, 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 at possible um, um, bores that farmers had sunk. Um, but there was a, there was a, the, the best water, which is now the Antipodes water, um, came from a kiwi fruit orchard where the farmers had sunk a bore and mm. tapped into this water source and uh, a student was doing his PhD in water quality and had um, you know described this water as being the you know the he'd metalized it somehow yeah the best the best the, you know the best water in the country so um, when we started they bottled our you know we used their water source mm. and they bottled our, our, our first um, bottles which which we bought in from Germany or whatever at huge expense so you know Weirdly, I think again, just coming from advertising, where you, where you are, where you focused on the end product is much more important than the than how you get to it. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, but what is it like? What would it look and feel like? Um, and so these these you know each bottle of water was enormously expensive, but but again, our view was well, let's just put it out there and see what happens, and let's talk to the market that that probably appreciates it, which is the restaurateur mm -hmm. market. And that's where Antibody started. So there wasn't a lot of television advertising or anything. There was just nothing. Went, just drove out to restaurants and said, try it. Yeah. And, and that, to Simon's credit, Simon worked, yeah. you know, day and night doing that. And Simon had great contacts in the, yeah. in the restaurant. And, you know, he was much loved in the restaurant yeah. industry. So that gave him a, a bit of a leg up. Um, but, the, but, but I remember, so that's how the bottle started. The name um, Kim Thorpe yeah. came up with. He said, I just think Antipodes is such a We're down under, yeah. funny name and sort of mm. like it's interesting. It, so Antipodes it was. So fast forward Very today, how many of these, I mean, these bottles, are, are a lot of them sold? Yeah, so I've sold my shares I realize too, that, by the way. But, but it's um, become a very reasonable sized business. Oh, it's no. a great business. And it's in, I think, seven or eight different um, countries, you know, at scale. Yeah. Um, and it's won, you know, the world's best water awards and all. Um, Fantastic. But this, this thing starts around somebody's kitchen table. Yeah. And there's a message there in that, yeah. of course. You've got to have a, a dream trying to help a mate out yeah. the way it goes. But um, that wasn't the story behind Lewis Road Creamery, was no. it? No. The Lewis Road Creamery story, Kim, started, you know, there are always, there are always millions of reasons why you do something. And, mm. and, and, and I always think... You know, things are only logical in retrospect. They're never logical in the in the heat of the moment. So there are a number of sort of reasons that it, mm. that it got going. But one of them for me is I'm a I love butter. You know, like I'm a big <laughs> white bread and butter guy. You know, I always have been. And so I love a baguette. You know, oh, I yeah, love yeah, ham, yeah, yeah. and so you know, off we go. Um, and over the, over the years, the quality of New Zealand butter in my mind was all over the shop. And as a sort of a brand guy. I, I could never quite understand why, you know, uh, European butters, you know, came in foil and everything else, and ours were in paper and and actually much better butter. Mm. Like, you know, the butter Technic itself was technically much, 
much better. And the reason for that is that New Zealand, you know, from the 60s when, when the whole milk powder market, you know, mm. was developed, all its focus has been on sort of commodity. Yeah, big um, volumes. Yeah, and, and things like fresh milk and butter are almost like an, um, uh, you know, a, a, an afterthought mm. and it would be better if we didn't have to do it at all sort of thing. So, so they never got the love. I was in a supermarket on uh, New World Vic Park on yeah. a Sunday afternoon. It was in the middle of winter. It was wet and miserable, and so so I went off to do the supermarket shopping. And so I was sort of you know pushing the trolley along, thinking about life, and re and reaching for my you know lure pack, and and literally had one of those moments of you know what am I as a Kiwi doing with a with a Danish product? Like what? How does that? How does that? compute. And then that evening we were going out, and my wife and I were going out to dinner with a group of my daughter's parents. Mm -hmm. You know, they're sort of, you know, yeah. you form those sort of um, parent group things, and it was lots of fun. And we were having, we were having dinner, Kim and I were sitting opposite um, Rob yeah. McDonald. Rob was saying to me, so Pete, what are you up to? And I, and I was... Don't tell me, you told me you're getting into business. Yeah, I did. I said, <laughs> well, you know, I, actually what I said first was... <laughs> and and I, and I can remember that, and I thought, mm, oh yeah, and I'm going to start a, a butter company. And I just sort of volunteered this sort of, because you know, it was the back of my mind, it suddenly came in front of my mind. And he said, well, that's interesting, that's interesting, people. but it's not going to be like a boot of the car company, is it? So I said, no, 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 this, I'm, I, you know, I'm really serious about it. So that, that was like the burning bridges moment mm -hmm. where it's like, hang about, I've said I'm going to do it now, so I can't wow. undo it. So the next morning I rang New World, mm -hmm. the manager picked up the phone, and he was Jason Woody Hera, who's, mm -hmm. who's, you know, who, who's in my sort of, you know... Uh, Supermarket hero. Uh, he, but he's <laughs> a fabulous guy. Yeah. I said, look, um, I just have this idea that, 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 that New Zealand should make the best butter in the world, and if I can figure out a way to do it, will you sell it? And he, he, he said, you make it, I'll sell it. Um, and, and that's what happened? Yeah. The reason it's called Lewis Road, Lewis Road Creamery mm -hmm. uh, is that, and the Antipodes plant was on yeah. Lewis Road. Down in Bay of Plenty. Yeah, East and, yeah. and um, the production manager at, at, at Lewis Road at the time was, a, was a, again, out of the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. Really good guy, a guy called Andrew Railton. But he was the first guy that, I, that I'd spoken to who, who said, you know, I think that's a really good idea. And so um, I said, right, well, Andrew, I've got to, I'm reasonably busy in Auckland. I've, you know, a few things going on, but, but somehow or other we've got to figure out how we're going to make butter if we... And, it's got to be good butter. Yeah, and a lot of the effort was actually spent researching how to make butter. You know, we, we, spent, we spent months because there's no knowledge anymore. You know, it's all there's just a billions big, of tons of yeah, but butter it's all through a big them. machine. Okay, you know, the days of actually making butter the way that butter. So the Lewis Road made. butter was actually sort of handmade butter. Yeah, it was handmade, and the very first butter we made in a um, in a off uh, out of season fruit packing shed, which was, you know, food yeah. approved. But look, I, there's a company called uh, Canary Enterprises who are butter reprocessors. They're the biggest butter reprocessors in the country. Their production manager has a recipe for butter, which, which is stellar, but it just sits on a shelf. Mm. So, you know, nothing. So I thought, right here we go. So I then contacted Canary, and we came to an agreement, which is, um, which is that they would make the butter using their using their recipe. So well, there is a difference. You buy, oh you yeah, buy, yeah, 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 So you're getting better butter. It's not just it's not just advertising hype. You're getting better butter. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what that's what I want. I mean, I wanted, to, but, but then I wanted to be able to do it at scale, and that yeah. was uh, because again, you know, there's no future in sort of, you know, yeah. there's lots of fun in being an artisan producer, yeah. but there's no there's Money, no yeah. there's no sort of future in it. There's no there's certainly no scale in it, mm. and it would go nowhere near achieving what I wanted to achieve, which was to prove that New Zealand could make good butter. You know, a commercially viable better butter. So, is your butter being exported? Yeah, the butter is. Um, having a stellar run in the US. The, the answer for New Zealand isn't for, for all of us to suddenly go so far up the value chain that, that you know, we have no volume anymore. We've got to have, we've got to appreciate that there's, a, that there's a happy balance between sort of commodity products and 
you know, value-added products. So I, I, I honestly thought you started off with really nice chocolate milk, actually. No, 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 no. We started with we, we started with butter, and then we still make the the real artisan butter, which yeah. is the handmade butter. Yeah. That's in, you know, that's yeah. like the the bee's Top knees of, of butters. Um, so the milk came along later. Yeah, and so the milk came along um, because once I started to understand the, you know, understand in inverted commas yeah. the dairy industry yeah. or some aspect of it. And, and why the products are as they are. I thought, nah, what, what's happening to milk? And in milk, um, at that time at least, all the milk that was sold commercially had um, sort of permeate added back into it, which is, a, which, is a, which is a byproduct of cheese production. But it was a, to me it was, you know, that's not real milk. This is... This is it's a beverage. Yeah. It's like, no wonder people don't like milk. Mm. What well, they do. So, so I thought, right, oh, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to do milk, and so I got a um, a glass bottle, you know, the old, the old. We used pint to get bottles. them as kids, yeah. deliver at home, yeah. Track some of those down, and track down a company called Green Valley Dairy, which was set up by Bruce Bullman, mm. who's a, a you know a dairy pioneer again, yeah. fabulous guy. So I went out to see his general manager and and said. Uh, Corey, I'm not sure sort of what I'm asking you for, but I, I want to be able to produce a really good milk from Jersey cows that goes in this glass bottle. So could <laughs> With you, the cream on the top. With the that. cream on the top, just yeah. the way it used to be. Uh, and he said, well, small problem, you know, our, our plant doesn't handle glass. And most plants these days, you know, the, the, the risk of glass is, yes. is such. So, so he said, so you're going to have to get over that little problem. So we then designed, so I thought, right, we can fix that. So we then designed, you know, the, the, the special, the, the, the yeah. special um, at that time, plastic yeah. bottle that's, that's become, you know, it's become the benchmark ready for... So uh, you had to put some tooling together. Piece, right? Yeah, and that was a big, you know, that was a reasonable investment on my part. Um, did that. Uh, my original intention was Jersey milk because, you know, everything I've read about is the best milk comes from Jersey cars. And Corey uh, Den Haring, who was general manager, said, look, we can go one better. We can do Jersey organic milk. So I thought, great, Jersey organic, let's do that. That sounds good. Yeah, and he said, uh, I said so how much have you got? And he said, oh, I think we've got enough for, you know, your, the volumes you'll be doing. So off we went, and uh, that just went, you know, that just took off. That led us right down this organic route. That resonates with consumers today. Absolutely, and, 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 and so it should. A combination of, of Cart Down agreeing to take um, butter on the shelves and New World having been supportive from the beginning really got us going. So anyway, so I was talking to Farrows about taking on our milk and I was talking to Janine Draper who mm. started um, uh, Farrows and her husband and partner James. And, and there's always confusion about which one of them said it, but one of them said, look, all this white milk's all very fine, but what I really want is a chocolate milk. Could you do a chocolate milk? This is over lunch. Yeah. You know, yeah. Best, best, best things are done at lunch. Yep. Um, and I said, oh, I'm sure we could do that. I'm sure we could do that. So um, as luck would have it, I had worked with um, Whitakers for, for, for many yeah. years. And so I picked up the phone, uh, literally again the next morning, to Holly Whitaker, who you know was just mm -hmm. really starting her. She's now, I think, joint CEO mm -hmm. there. But to say, And said, Holly, look, I, you know, I, want, I, I want to do a chocolate milk. And if I'm going to do a chocolate milk, I only want to do it with a, with with you. So, mm. could you do it? And, and you know, to a, to a vast credit, she said, "Yeah, no, we, yeah, I think, yeah, well, we, no, we." Because that's that. tricky, isn't it? Oh, it's really tricky. It's really complicated. But also, it's tricky for a brand like Whitaker's, who you know, their brand is incredibly. So important. it's a joint marketing arrangement, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, and that was one of the first significant, uh, if not the first, really significant joint brand launch in the country. Chocolate. But that got you a whole another lot of consumers because oh, of course fabulous. people love you know Whitakers. I mean yeah. gee I mean I was there like a Robert's yeah. dog. I said, wow. And and, and and what happened It's an indulgence with, that drink. Isn't absolutely. It? Yeah. But it happened at a time when social media was really taking off. Oh yes. Um, and and my daughter Grace was the very yeah. first Facebook follower of Lewis Ray Creamery, yeah. <laughs> and then her circle of friends, and then their parents. So there's quite an active underworld here. Of, it of became the... really, really, really potent, and and I think that 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 we were incredibly lucky to launch Lewis Road in the in the era of the beginnings of all that social media. Social stuff. media. But Peter, it seems to me that you know, if 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 you're to look back. Uh, 
there are some real interesting themes here. I mean, you've got involved yourself. You took the bits of knowledge that you had and were able to graft on other people. And it sounds to me like a team effort for a lot of the stuff that you've done. Yeah. Um, uh, is there anything you particularly want to change now, looking back over what has been an incredibly successful career? I give that like a little bit of thought every so often, mm. and then I think, well, you're not going to achieve anything by thinking, no, no. what should I have done? So I'm, I'm very focused on, I think, on sort of looking forward. Whatever I'm doing, I like to enjoy doing it. You know, if you're working with good people, you can, you can, you can, you can sort of crack anything. Um, well, if you were talking to a 25-year-old yeah. about getting into business today, would you encourage Oh, them? yeah, I'd say start tomorrow morning. Yeah. The fear yeah. of failure doesn't daunt you? No, not Because that's at all. one of the big problems with yeah. getting started, isn't it? I think um, when, we, <laughs> when, we, when we launched our butter, mm. um, there was Andrew Railton, who was the production mm. manager at Antipodes Water and Me, and, um, and we had our first opportunity to have a, a, a piece of media coverage um, in Life and Leisure magazine, and and there was Juno who I knew from way back, and 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 she said, yeah, well, I'll write a story on it. So she said, but we'll need some photographs. And 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 Andrew and I thought, well, what would a butter, what would a butter maker look like? You know, what <laughs> what do they look like? And so we decided they look sort of like chefs. So we went and dressed ourselves completely in chefs' outfits. You know. <laughs> And we were out in the out in the middle of a paddock somewhere or other, with, you know, <laughs> making butter as making you butter do. Against, you know. <laughs> and and I thought then, you know, I cannot look any more stupid than this. This is like <laughs> as silly as it's ever going to get. And 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 you just got to get over looking silly. You got to think, well, if I fail, it's at least I've given it a crack, which is better than not trying at all. And and, and that's a big piece of it. That's a great place to finish this interview. Give it a crack rather than not trying at all. So we had today, you know, partly showman, partly ad man, seriously good businessman, brand creator and lover of milk and butter. Peter Cullinan, thank you for being on Business at the Speed of Coffee. Come on. <laughs>